So thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you to you all. I'll start from Leonardo's sentence. Uh, we all know this sentence, this phrase, this kind of declaration. I'm a man without letters. Mm? Uh, maybe it is a statement, maybe it is a confession uh, with a little bit of shame and maybe a vindication. Sono un uomo senza lettere. I'm a man without letters. I think this sentence gives us a, a precise idea of Leonardo's horizon. And I think this horizon is also our horizon, the horizon of our time. That's why we find Leonardo's phrase uh, so telling, a mixture of shame and audacity. We are all men without letters. I think a whole century uh, of human sciences uh, teaches us what is a letter. Mm? That's a great question in all uh, uh, 20th century human sciences, linguistics, philosophy, psychoanalysis, history of thought. Uh, I could uh, cite some names, Walter Ong, Eric Everlock, uh, George Goody in the English-speaking world, or Emile Barveniste, Jacques Lacan, Roland Barthes in the, English, in the French-speaking world. And I would say, generally speaking, a letter is a technology, a logical paradigm, a condition of possibility of a one specific kind of experience. And I think I isolate three aspects of what we should uh, understand under this term umbrella letter. And uh, this is my horizon to understand what is it uh, a man without letters. First, to say letter, I think, means to say language, generally speaking. Leonardo is saying, I'm a man without language. I'm a man who, whose work is not inscribed, first of all, in the dimension of language. Uh, and I think knowledge has its paradigm, its condition of possibility in language. And language has one of its fundamental operators in what we call a name. And an, a form of knowledge which has its fundamental operator in what we call the name is a form of knowledge which supposes that things have something like an essence. And what's an essence? A great uh, philosophical question. I would say it is that point in which things are most similar to themselves, coincident with their profile, enclosed in their completeness. Uh, what's a tree? Uh, when, uh, we should ask, a tree is a tree. Should it be six feet high, ten feet, fifteen? When is it enough? What we call tree is, first of all, a projection of the name tree. And if language is the main technology of our knowledge, the image of being that technology promotes implies that beings have essences or, better said, are essences. Identity concentrates ideal condensations of a kind of immobility, the tree. Second, to say letters is to say language and a certain language, which is, for example, Greek or Latin in Leonardo's times. Now, Latin is, first of all, a structure, a grammar, and as somebody has said, I mean Roland Barthes, 
A grammar is something which obliges to say, it obliges to say in a certain way, according to the constraints of that grammar, it obliges, for example, to declare, first, first of all, a subject, then to link to that subject a predicate. And this means the predicate will be a second-class object, uh, linked to the subject in a quite accidental way. The predicate could be different, the subject would be absolutely the same. And this way, subjects become substance. Mm? The grammatical subject becomes the fundamental matter of universe. Substance, uh, something that lies at the bottom, something fundamental, subjectum in Latin, hypokaimenon in Greek, something lying at the bottom or behind everything. And predicate becomes accident or something unessential. So a form of knowledge which has its condition of possibility in this grammar which has its main technology in this form of obligation to say, will speak of a universe which is made of subjects and objects, of actions where something which is in the position of subject operates on something which is in the position of an object. Uh, the sun warms the stone. This is Kant's famous example. This is something which continues for a century with this unilateral causality. All the activity is on the one side, all the passivity is on the other side, all the time is going, so to say, from left to right. And this linearity of being is the direct projection of that fundamental technology, the Greek Latin letters. Third, to say letters is to say a science, a culture, which has language at its foundation and written language in particular. The condition of possibility is not only name, is not only one specific grammar, but a certain version of the name of the grammar. I mean written names, written language. If the idea of being is always the projection of a certain technology, a man with letters, not Leonardo, not us, our time, but a man with letters will have a certain idea of being. Being will be organized as a written language. And the historians of Greek and Latin culture, Eric Havelock, for example, have shown this link between the fact that Greek and Latin people wrote thanks to an alphabetical technology and not, for example, an ideographic technology. We are not Chinese, but we are becoming Chinese, but we are becoming Indian, but we are becoming Arab, which is a syllabic mechanism and not alphabetic. A link between the fact that Greek and Latin people wrote uh, thanks to an alphabetical technology and the fact that they develop a kind of implicit or explicit atomism. It is not by chance that the letters and the atoms have the same uh, word in Greek, stoicheion. Stoicheion is a letter of the alphabet, the first element or ultimate element of language and the first or ultimate element of matter, of the universe, stoicheion, stoicheia. Sure, Plato is not uh, an atomist, but we could say his whole project is an atomism of ideas, and not of unities of matter, and that his whole problem is to put it in connection, in communication, those atoms which are his ideae, his ideas. And it is the very same of Democritus, the great atomistic thinker, the, the great alternative to Plato, whose great uh, problem, Democritus' great problem, was to put in contact his atoms, to give an account of the formation of the aggregate, of the mixture, 
of the metamorphosis. Plato's solution will be the concept of metexis, of participation. Democritus' solution will be, will be the concept of clinamen, of inclination. But what I find absolutely telling is the problem they share, in spite of their immense difference. They are facing the same difficulty. They strive to imagine movement, transformation, passage from one state to another. They strive to think a whole class of things which lie outside the perimeter of the essence and of the grammar of the essence, of the technology they are acquainted with. They have essences, identities, immobilities, and strive to think the inessential, the non-identical, the floating element le signifiant flottant de Lévi-Strauss, de, euh, de Lacan. They can only think the essential, the letter, the tree which is literally a tree. But a tree is never a tree, literally. The tree is always becoming a tree, if anything. So, first point. Every system of science is a device, is a technology, a condition of possibility, and in a certain way, a condition of necessity for one specific ontological projection, for one specific experience of the world. Tell me what your science are, and I will tell you what idea of being you must develop, and also what kind of operations you will be able to develop with that kind of being or beings. Second point, let's resume. The name, the Indo-European grammar of Greek and Latin and Italian, and in a certain measure English, but not completely, will give us a universe of static things, a quiet universe, solid, coherent, within which everything is what its essence and its name says it should or must be. Everything is, so to say, apud se, near to itself. Third point, this is to say that being is discrete within this paradigm and uh, on the basis of this technology. Universe is made of detached pieces and not of a continuous fabric. These pieces are coincident with themselves and only in a second time they can, they can give birth to aggregates, undergo a process and know something like a metamorphosis. The aggregate, the mixture, the process, the metamorphosis is un inessential, unessential. And the inessential is not an object of science or an object of technology. The inessential is not, generally speaking. Let's now imagine that all of this fades away. Let's now imagine a man without letters and a mankind without letters, a whole culture without letters. Letters are not the main access. Literacy is no longer the only mold of being. And our, operation, our operations are not always mediated by letters. They don't apply to discrete objects. This is Leonardo's condition. I'm a man without letters. So no uomo senza lettere. He is without letters. He has the art of drawing the art of painting. And this is also our condition. We have new languages, which are called languages for a kind of laziness. Our new languages are not languages in any way. They don't, they don't carry with them the dimension of the name, of the subject predicate grammar, the spontaneous atomism of alphabetic writing, 
the spontaneous vocation to immobility of essentialism. We have other systems of science which give birth to new kinds of objects, which first of all are not, at a closer look, objects. The inessential becomes essential. <clears throat> the essential becomes something that has no essence. The vague, the fluid, the undecidable, the mobile, the floating, the becoming, the metamorphic. This is our essential. Think of how many things, how much of our knowledge, of our sciences, or of our technical applications emerges from graphic modeling, mathematical writing of the continuous, hmm? virtual projections of series of events. These graphic technologies, these mathematical writings are the new conditions of possibility, the new paradigm of being and of the experience of being. And what they offer to us are not objects, but processes. Our being is made of topological transformations. Is not a substance, hypokaimenon, subjectum, something lying, uh, self-identical, ultimately at the bottom of all things. It's not a substance, but a kind of continuous morphogenesis. We have only the surface of a form without matters, without substance. We should study what is topology, and uh, topology as a condition of possibility, hmm? as uh, a lens through which we create things, not as a description, as a prescription. We should study what is a differential equation and what kind of being it designs. We cannot do this here. I attempted to do this elsewhere. But no doubt, the first <coughs> consequence for someone who remains sans a letter, without letters, is that all our conceptual oppositions, which descend directly from the idea of a discrete being, lose completely their grip on reality. Uh, subject and object, the idea that something is the active element and something the passive element, the difference between inside and outside, the idea of causality which puts on the one hand the subject or the inside and on the other hand the object or the outside and the opposition with, between form and matter or between male and female, all of which all of that, what fixed, was defined, and now is floating, is shifting uh, into its other side. And finally, there is no other side. There is only one side, folding and unfolding. There is one and only metamorphosis, one and only thing which happens in multiple and simultaneous variations. That's our being, that's the being of a mankind without letters. Mankind uh, uh, which thinks through graphic modelization and differential equations or system of equations, differential calculus. So let's come back to Leonardo. What kind of being is designed by drawing? what kind of being is designed by painting, his way of drawing, his way of painting. What kind of knowledge is, or technology is, that kind of knowledge and of technology which has in drawing, in painting, its condition of possibility, its fundamental language, so to speak, its fundamental and transcendental technology. <clears throat> I say something which is well known, who studies Leonardo knows that uh, the first specific grammar of Leonardo's painting is the nuance. 
And it is not an aesthetic feature. It is not an aesthetic choice. Uh, we should think of it, of the nuance, as a specific grammar. His painting is painting of nuances. And the second specific grammar of Leonardo's work is the curve, the wave, the vortex. And here again, it is not simply a theme. Uh, even if you can isolate it as a theme. It is not an object. He loves passionately. It is not something of this kind. The curly hair of the Virgin of the La Roche, the vortexes of water in a river, the stamen of sunflowers, the leaves of grass you are seeing, this is water in the Navigli, a system of canals around Milan. The leaves of grass, the wind, he studies uh, thousands of plates on the storms, on the movement of the wind, on the structure on, of clouds. It is not a theme, it is not an object among others. And it is not simply a series of objects which obsessed Leonardo for some psychological reason. It is something more profound, migrating from one context to another, the portrait, uh, the technical uh, drawing. It is a grammar migrating from one object to another object. We have a grammar, a condition of possibility, a technology which must produce its own effects in all and every different context. We have the pure form of drawing, and if drawing is your technology, then your content, your object, your matter, will be the continuous then the grammar of your objectivity will be continuity. And if the continuity of the line is your technology, this continuity of the ink on the smooth surface of paper, we should study the intimate materiality of this technology. And we could make some interesting observation on the transcendentality of the materiality of the practice, the kind of paper, the kind of uh, uh, pencil, the kind of ink, all of this produces the, the shift of the drawing on a surface. And this will be the essence, the inessential essence of your object, which is not an object which is a process. All of this is a consequence of the structure ink paper in some way, of the transcendentality of the ink on the paper. And being, being cannot be linear, cannot make angles. Uh, it is not Dürer's incision. You are not uh, uh, it is not the incidence on a plate of uh, wood, for example. It is not xilography. Here, being cannot make angles, cannot make jumps, cannot make zigzags. It must be curved. It must change gradually. It must inflect around itself. It must change in a curvy and complicated and recursive way, and almost baroque way. <coughs> if your fundamental technology is drawing, the curve, the nuance, then being will have the, this curvy shape. Hmm? And the things you will imagine and realize, they will be curvy in turn. And the operations you will imagine, they will be curvy in turn. I will isolate some long-lasting consequences of this shift from one grammar to another.
from one language to another, to drawing, to design. First, nothing is solid, concrete. Transformations are not transformation of something lying at the bottom. There is no subject of the variation. There is no substance of the accident. At the bottom of one transformation, there is another transformation. We have only surfaces. There is no deepness. Nothing is first, nothing is ultimate. Second, the drawing is not the image of something, but the image of an operation, the ongoing construction of what once we called the object. Drawing is not the portrait of an object. The drawing is the immanent law of a system of transformations, the intrinsic regularity of an operation. To draw, this means to show the constructive rule, not the external appearance of one thing, and not the dialectical relationship between the appearance and the being of that appearance. We have no opposition between appearance, aesthetics, aesthetics, and being, the profound uh, essence of things. It is all floating on a one-dimensional surface. To draw is to construct something, not to photograph and portrait something not to show its already completed construction. Drawing is not after the process, after becoming has made his course, his process. And since there are no objects, there are no subjects. We are not subjects. We are no longer in the position of the subject. When we draw, when Leonardo draws, we are the non-subjective, the anonymous interceptor of a non-objective, an anonymous operation. Third, technology is no longer the application of an already formulated knowledge. And knowledge is no longer the static contemplation of an object which will be transformed by a technician. The relationship, so to say, between the engineer and the scientist is completely upside down. To know, this means to intercept one operation, the old object, within another operation, the old subject. To know is a certain continuation of ourselves in the object or of the object in ourselves. We are becoming our things. But our things are far more than things. Our things are becoming subjects. But we, the subject, are far more than subjects. We already are dispersed in the world and without identity, floating as lines which intercept other lines and enter other lines of being. I thank you. <laughs>